In the developed world, reliable electricity is something we've all come to take for granted. But in Texas back in February 2021, winter storm Uri, as it was called, knocked out power throughout the state, sub-freezing temperatures, billions of dollars in damage resulted, and hundreds of deaths. That caught the attention not only of the public, but of policymakers. Since then, preparing the Texas grid for extreme weather has been a focus of the state of Texas and a topic of conversation. But even beyond extreme weather, there are other more normal pressures. Texas is a fast-growing state in terms of population, economic expansion, more electric vehicles on the road, and to the surprise of many of us, cryptocurrency mining is a huge draw on the electric grid. All those things have increased demands on Texas energy infrastructure. With all of those trends showing no signs of slowing, the question we're beginning to ask is what needs to be done to meet the state's evolving needs? I'm Ed Emmett, a fellow at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy in Houston, Texas, and this is Baker Briefing. Here with me today are Ken Medlock, Senior Director of the Baker Institute Center for Energy Studies, and Peter Hartley, an economics professor at Rice and energy economics scholar at the Baker Institute. Thank you both for being here. So let's start with a basic question. What is ERCOT? Prior to URI, most people, they maybe they'd heard of it, but they didn't really know. So what is ERCOT? When was it created and what does it do? Ken? Uh, sure. So ERCOT is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, ERCOT. It was actually formed in 1970, but did not become the system operator, the independent system operator, ISO, for Texas until we get to 1996. So it had been in place, sort of acting as a monitor more than anything else, and and formally took over system operations of the grid in Texas in 1996. So it's got a bit of a winding history that actually precedes 1970 when it was formally created, going all the way back to the late 1930s with some federal legislation that really saw some large Texas utilities decide not to connect to the rest of the country because they wanted to avoid federal oversight. So they they chose to be intrastate entity. So the history of ERCOT and the idea of, you know, it being an island unto itself and operating really exclusively from the rest of the grid, it goes back almost 100 years now. It's it's a pretty pretty long and winding road. The um, other thing to say about that is that ERCOT is what we call an independent system operator. So it doesn't own any generation capacity and it doesn't sell any electricity. It's responsible for setting the rules of the marketplace where electricity is bought and sold. And as its name implies, it does have responsibility for reliability, ensuring the system is operating at all times uh, according to very stringent requirements. A lot of people don't really realise that for an electricity system to be effective at delivering power to the customers, you have to have a fine balance of supply and demand at all times. And this is one reason why these extreme events are causing problems because you know, the system will fall over <laughs> if you don't have that balance maintained. And ERCOT covers almost all of Texas, not quite all. There are pieces that are carved out and we won't get into why those were carved out. We'll just go forward assuming ERCOT is the Texas grid for the most part. So you describe the Texas grid as an island that's largely disconnected from the rest of the continental United States. What are the benefits and what are the drawbacks and Recently, there's been legislation introduced in the U.S. Congress, I think it's called Connect the Grid Act, where they want to force ERCOT into the rest of the nation. Pros and cons. So this question about connecting ERCOT to the rest of the grid really rose almost to its peak in the wake of Winter Storm Uri, because there were a lot of, quite frankly, advocacy-laden arguments that if Texas had been connected to the rest of the country, URI wouldn't have been as bad. We actually published a paper about a year after URI, sort of a retrospective, looking back what we learned and what had happened. And one of the things we recommended was to actually do the counterfactual analysis. What if Texas had been connected? And there's a lot that can be learned in that exercise because it hasn't been done. That's the first thing to say. So a lot of the statements that are made are It's got a lot of political undertones, but they are not actually rooted in a firm analysis. So 
Why does that matter? Well, because if you think back to say 1990, and imagine Texas began to integrate all the way back then. Why go back that far? Because you have to build transmission capacity, you have to build power plants, you know, the entire architecture of the grid would have looked very different if we were to go back 30 years and kind of redesign the system so that ERCOT is, is integrated. So if you do that, one of the things that you'll likely see, because Texas has a lot of land, it's relatively easy to site and build infrastructure, it's got tremendous natural resources, you probably would have seen a lot more power generation capacity built in the state of Texas. And Texas today would likely be a massive net exporter of electricity. So that sounds great very, I think, demonstrable from an exercise like that, gains from trade that would benefit Texas. But to make the claim then that that would have benefited reliability and made URI less severe is a little bit off. Because quite frankly, the issue with URI had nothing to do with where the resources were cited, had to do with whether or not they worked. And if you had more generation in Texas and the same weatherization standards that we had rolling into URI, for example, and the same lack of recognition of the integration of electric power and natural gas that has grown over the years, it would have been much worse, not better. So I think there's two discussions to be had when you think about Connect the Grid. One, is it really serve reliability? And two, are there positive gains from trade that Texas could benefit from? And I think it's an open question without a doubt, but until that analysis is done, it's hard to actually make a definitive statement. The general proposition again is that if you connect up electric systems across a wider area, that has a benefit of reducing the amount of reserve capacity that the system as a whole needs to, to have on hand because you can rely on the neighbors you know, for some emergencies. But of course, it's more complicated to coordinate across a much bigger area. And there are transmission losses as well associated with that. And then, as Ken points out, it also has implications for the development of the system. So all these things together, it's not clear necessarily. And the other thing about URI was that we had a lot of the neighboring systems had emergencies at the same time. So even if we had been connected and even if we hadn't been exporting a lot of power, uh, there may not have been much power for us to import. And on top of the fact that they had emergencies, we also had outages with the DC lines that do connect Texas with the surrounding systems. So that's also another issue that may not have helped with the import of power. Why DC connections? Well, that speaks to the issue I said, that if you have a system covering a wider area, you have to synchronize it if it's all going to be on AC. So an easier connection is a DC connection because you don't have to maintain all the cycles in phase. Uh, to transmit power between the systems that way. But you can transmit less, typically. The term reliability keeps coming up over and over. And we heard it this past winter. Every time the public thought it might get really cold, they said, oh, are we going to have a reliable grid? And as I mentioned, policymakers, parentheses politicians, took to heart what happened during Winter Storm Uri, And the Texas legislature responded by passing a series of bills what have these new laws accomplished? Have they improved the reliability of ERCOT and the grid? I think we got a decent test of that in mid-January of this year when Winter Storm Heather is now what it's called, struck. We didn't used to name Winter no, Storm. No, I, I, I get it, but it's what yes, people Winter associate Storms, with, yeah. right? So <laughs> I think we got some decent insight into the effectiveness of the steps that have been taken since year. One of the simplest corrections that was able to be made relatively quickly was designate certain points of load on the system. So for example, compressor stations on pipeline. Designate those as critical load. Prior to URI, it turned out that a lot of the compressor stations on natural gas pipeline systems, they use electricity to operate, but they weren't designated as critical load. So when the load shed orders came in the wake of URI hitting, the distribution utilities are just looking at their service territories and they're cutting off areas that are not designated as critical, not realizing what's there. And so the compression on the system, the pipeline systems actually was shut down. And so you saw less gas flowing as a result of that, which meant at the power plants, you can't combust as much gas to generate power. And so you get in this very unvirtuous cycle, right? That was a huge problem. This was pointed out during some testimony in the wake of URI, and it was noted, I think, that 185, and these are two-page applications, applications were filed right in the wake of URI to be designated as critical load. So, most of those were pipeline compression. That's a really interesting insight that 
is really, a, quite frankly, a, um, a bureaucratic failure more than anything else. But when it happened, it triggered this just cascading negative spiral effect, if you will. Now, other things have been done, like mandating weatherization of different facilities. Not all of that is complete yet, so there's still work to be done, but how we've actually gone into looking at how ancillary services are provided, how they're actually compensated. There's a lot of things, I don't know, Peter, if you wanna jump in here, but so a lot of things that have been done and that are still being done, because it takes time to execute them all, but the simple fact that we actually identified critical load as critical that was, that was necessary, and some of the weatherization that was done has actually served a, a massively important purpose in maintaining reliability so far. I might just back up and once again comment the first part of your question you asked about, we hear about reliability. Why is reliability important? The sort of point there is that electricity these days is absolutely essential to modern lifestyle. So many things depend on us having access to electricity. And so when it's cut off, it is incredibly costly. As you pointed out, you know, we had people die as a result of electricity being shut off, but it's so essential to modern life. So when that happens, it's just extremely costly. And that's why it became a big political issue when it was cut off. Yeah, the word politics keeps creeping in here in the politically charged environment we're in. Texas has become a leader in renewable energy production, specifically wind and solar. And I know some people were saying the fact that we had so much wind and solar was bad, and others were saying, no, that's good. What, what's your take? Just sort of briefly, uh, I don't want to get us off into yeah. that debate. but It's funny the way you frame the question, because some were saying good, some were saying bad. It's actually a little from column A and a little from column B, right? So when you think about the environmental externality, so dealing with emissions from combustion of fossil fuels for power generation, it's actually good on average because you're seeing an increase in the average amount of power every year that's generated from renewables. The problem is when you have a discussion about reliability, averages are completely meaningless because electric load you know, varies every second of every day and it's up and down and the system operator has to be able to call on resources on demand to meet that variation in load. And the trouble with renewables, wind and solar in particular, in that context is they are non-dispatchable. So you don't have control over when they're available. That's mother nature. And so when they're not available, you have to have sufficient backup or dispatchable capacity that you can call on to serve the purpose of maintaining reliability on the grid. In Texas, we've been in an interesting situation where we haven't really seen any expansion of dispatchable capacity for over a decade now. Demand continues to rise. That's largely because of population and the economy. And I think I used an analogy at a conference recently. It's like we're driving in Texas this really beautiful sports car down the road going 150 miles an hour, but we're doing it without insurance. At some point, we're going to hit a bump in the road and it's not going to go well. And that's kind of where we are at this point. I mean, the big thing is in a power system where all the capacity is under your control, you do need backup to be able to handle fluctuations in demand. Okay, But when you've got non-dispatchable power, I mean, apart from the fact that you can't order it up when you want it, wind and solar, the other problem is that it can fluctuate an enormous amount in terms of the amount of power it's supplying over a very short interval of time. So you need much, much more backup capacity in a system with highly fluctuating generation because you've got to smooth, in a sense, both demand and the supply from the weather-dependent generation. That's why maintaining reliability is a much more difficult issue, a much more critical issue. Yeah, reliability is an issue of control, quite frankly. For a system operator, it's what can I control, what can I not control, and you want to, to mitigate the risk of an unreliable grid, you need as much control as possible. And that just means dispatchability. It doesn't mean it has to be natural gas. It doesn't mean it has to be batteries. It just has to be something that the operator can control. Ultimately, the determination about what that is is a question of economics. What's the least cost option to, to pursue? Okay, in that regard, in your paper, I believe, a portfolio of insurance options were described for improving grid reliability. So thinking about the financial and political constraints, of which options offer the best path forward? So we explored from the perspective in the paper more about physical reliability. So just in terms of dispatchability and how that could be managed. We also looked at transmission constraints, which I'm gonna let Peter talk about because he did a lion's share of the work looking at how locational marginal prices reflect transmission constraints and how they emerge on the system. And they're prevalent without a doubt. But 
the things that we really highlighted are a we need to cite more dispatchable resources on the on the texas grid b we need to cite resources that are controllable closer to load centers because one of the things we've seen in the state of texas is demand is really growing in the so-called texas triangle which is that region between the dallas fort worth area austin san antonio over to houston that's really where the population centers are demand growth is but we've been closing down dispatchable generation in that window while we've been opening non-dispatchable resources in West Texas and South Texas. And so not only is that creating an issue associated with uncontrollability, it's also creating an issue because we don't have enough transmission to actually manage the flow of supply from those regions into where demand is actually growing the most rapidly. So that, of, of course, then opens the door for storage options. You can think about you know, expanding long duration, short duration storage in utility service areas as well as near production areas to help smooth the flow of electric power from where it's being generated along the transmission lines we do have to load centers. But then finally, we need more transmission. It's really that simple. Yeah, so the, the reliability is not just a function of the type of generation on the system and how much supply is fluctuating, how much demand is fluctuating. It also is a function of location. Because of the limited ability to transmit power from one location to another, you really need balance at particular locations as well. So if you don't have adequate transmission capacity, it can also create a problem. But one of the other issues you have, as Ken's kind of pointing out, we're putting the generation a long way away from where the demand is. You have to add a lot of transmission. But that transmission capacity you're adding is very expensive, can be very expensive because it's not being used very efficiently. If you've got this uh, generation that's only generating part of the time, you're only using that transmission line part of the time. So it ends up being quite expensive per unit of power transmitted. Plus it's a long distance away and it also makes the network, quite frankly, harder to, to stabilise when you've got sort of lots of very long lines. So there are lots of issues here. Coming back to your point about politics keeps coming up. I mean, one thing I would say actually about that is that there's sort of a bit of a problem there. There are very significant engineering issues and economic issues associated with managing a power system. It's one of the most complicated systems that people have invented, you know. The problem is when you start having the whole thing run by po politics, the average voter has no idea of the complicated engineering and economic issues that are involved. And having sort of a popularity contest for choosing what generation we're going to add to the system and so on is not a, a recipe for a very happy outcome. And I think that's one of the problems of having a lot of politics involved in it. I'll add so this comes back to something you said in the introduction about cryptocurrency mining and electrification. Recognizing what I just said about where load is growing in the state of Texas, if we start to really push the envelope in those domains, you're gonna need even more power in those massive population centers. And the current grid in Texas is not constructed to do that successfully. And so it really is gonna need a lot of investment, but not just in transmission, also in generation, but generation that's ultimately controllable. So this is not an issue that's going away. It's actually going to get worse over time, probably before it gets better. And actually another point here is a lot of these issues are not restricted to Texas. No. So a lot of the same pressures are happening in many other developed countries, and many of them are experiencing similar kinds of reliability problems and some of these other issues that we're talking about. Well, that brings us to the concluding question. We keep talking about the general public, and yes, the complexities, I don't understand them. They probably don't. Even deciding who you're going to buy your electricity from these days is a, it's a complicated decision in a household. But beyond that, understanding that the public wants to flip a switch and have a light come on, they really don't care about a whole lot else. What in your minds does the future look like for Texas? Can ERCOT be counted on to provide competitive and consistent electricity in the face of all these issues we've just discussed? The short answer is yes. I think there will be bumps in the road. But interestingly, the market participants, particularly the large market participants, like large industrial consumers of power, large commercial users of power, they will begin to exercise different sets of options than those that you and I have, for example. So we've already seen some large industrials make overtures or even sign MOUs to develop their own behind the meter generation, right? That enables them to ensure reliability for what they need. And then under the right regulatory system, be able to wheel power back to the grid if it's needed there. 
That's not really the end game at the current moment, but certainly the industrials are looking at on-site generation as an option because they see what's going on in the broader grid on ERCOT and they recognize that reliability for them is really a different type of issue. It's If I have to shut my plant down, it's not just a simple issue of not consuming power. It means I may have, may have some things that go cold, have to re-ramp, that means my entire assembly line has to change. It's, it's, it's very costly. And for new entities that are trying to come into the state of Texas, we saw this, for example, raised when AWS was looking at, at coming to Texas a couple of years. If reliability is a question mark, they won't come. Mm-hmm. And so it becomes a massive economic issue for the state. Yeah, so I think we should go, going back to Euros, one, one point I would like to make, which is that the ERCOT engineers really did a tremendous job at keeping the system actually operating <laughs> under very severe stress at the time. The engineers know a lot about how to keep it going. And the thing to avoid the most damaging outcome is where you go to what's called a, a complete blackout of the system and you have to have what's called a black start to start the system back up. And we would be without power for a very, very long time if, if that happened. And the ERCOT engineers managed to avoid that. I think the other thing is the lessons you know, that we, le- we learned, as Ken pointed out, these sort of coordination issues between natural gas electricity systems. We learned about that. We've taken steps to repair those kinds of problems. And then this awareness of the need for backup capacity and to stabilize the system and so on, I think is provoking reforms that will be uh, very worthwhile and useful for maintaining stability. The one thing I would say though, is if you keep on interfering politically, one thing you won't be able to control is the increase in cost, increase in prices. And this is something else that's happening in many other jurisdictions around the world, that we're keeping systems going by adding a lot of these unstable sources of generation and so on, but only at greatly increased cost. And that's another thing that uh, you need to keep your eye on in addition to reliability. Ken Medlock, Peter Hartley, thank you very much for uh, participating in this briefing today. Uh, I know I speak for a lot of people. We're, We're glad experts like you are looking at the issues and hopefully the people who make the decisions are listening to you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Baker Briefing is brought to you by the Baker Institute for Public Policy, which provides meaningful, nonpartisan policy analysis on the most critical challenges facing Texas, the U.S., and the world. Baker Briefing is produced by Victoria Jupp, Shannon Moriarty, and Karina Zimmel. AV production is led by Kevin Young. Our interns are Rice University students Riley Barker, Gray Bobien, and Maria Marcus. To learn more, including how you can attend a live podcast recording on the campus of Rice University, visit us at bakerinstitute.org. Thank you for listening.